So let's just start with a bit of an overview. I need to work out how deep we need to go. Um, and I have, I will admit, not brought a quiz for you to do today. So, um, how many of you, rough show of hands, have had a look at the desk lectures already? Not many. Cool. That's, today is awesome because I also think I have the desk lecture slides instead of the slide pack that I want. I'm not going to put any of that on the recording just in case I get carefully deny it. Um, we could talk about the parole evidence rule and what the contract is, but anyway. Uh, so capacity, let's start at the very beginning. So what is the topic of capacity about? Why do we care whether somebody has capacity or not? Valid, void, voidable. Uh, we're, so we're well, looking at whether a contract is valid, void or voidable. But it's not a foundation element, it's just whether to prove that contract, any of those three. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you can force that Thank you. Thank you. I also have lipstick. Just in case you were wondering if I ever like actually try and look good for you, like I carry lipstick with me, so clearly I care, and it's the thought that counts. Um, so you've jumped ahead a couple of steps. No, good steps. So we'll, I'm yes. getting Will, Bill, Will, I don't you're completely different people, you don't I'm look Frederick alike. Today. You're going to be Frederick today, that would help me because yeah. Will and Bill are too similar. Okay, so yes, well Frederick didn't say, what Will <laughs> did say is absolutely correct. Uh, that uh, the question of capacity doesn't go to whether or not there is a contract or not. It only goes to the extent that the contract might or might not be enforceable or the circumstances in which it might or it might not be enforceable. Uh, and so really the question of capacity goes fundamentally to the idea that do all of the parties have the capacity, in this case it's a synonym really for the idea of um, ability to enter into a contract. Just well, a quick question. Bill, uh, Fred. Yep. The interchangeability, or perhaps not, of the terms enforceable, voidable, void, how are we best to approach that? Okay, let's, can you hold that? Because yep, I sure. had a slide on exactly Great. that point. Well, I'm fairly sure I do, and if I don't, I'll make it up at the end and get there. Um, but you're right to actually question, are they... I've got to keep holding my phone so we get recording. Sorry about that, guys. You are right to actually question, are they, are they interchangeable terms? Mm -hmm. So keep that in the back of your mind. So, you know what you had to read. Hopefully you did that at least, even if you haven't looked at the desk lectures. Personally, I'd go to desk lecture first and then the reading. So I won't judge you if you haven't done the reading today. Um, it was, I'm actually hoping people got a break. So key point to start with. Capacity is not an element of formation. What are the elements of formation? You know them upside down by now. We are looking at do we have all of these pieces of this beautiful, elegant jigsaw puzzle that we call contract formation. Agreement, offer that contains all of the terms necessary to make an agreement matched with acceptance that has been communicated and does not seek to vary those terms or sometimes you can't find those things so you're looking for some kind of consensus does it have consideration so do those terms make it clear that there is an exchange of some kind does each party give something in exchange for the promises that they receive? Consideration is the price of the promise. Was the agreement intended by the parties to be a legal relationship? And then is there certainty as to what the terms are? Um, or does it meet the, is there sufficient legal certainty? Which means is there certainty as to the terms or clarity might be another word that we use there. Uh, are all of the essential terms included um, and are the promises not illusory? So in fact, is there real consideration is another way of looking at that part. 
uh, for each of the promises that are made. So they're the elements of a contract. Now, if we have all of those elements, there are still some questions that we need to ask. Firstly, are there formalities that we need to comply with? Actually, secondly, because we're going to do that next. But also, do the parties have capacity to enter into the contract? So again, we can have a contract, can meet all of those requirements, but the question can become, did all of the parties have the capacity to contract? And what happens if they don't? So who lacks capacity? We're going to concentrate on <laughs> you lack capacity. <laughs> Often I lack capacity, I have to say. Um, we're going to focus on minors, right? There are some special rules that relate to minors, but minors are, from an evidence point of view, the easiest ones to deal with. Um, a couple of people uh, noted in the assignment, the first assignment, and um, it did make me smile. In fact, it, one of them made me laugh out loud uh, in a good way, I mean, laughing with, not laughing at, uh, that the, there was a risk that the egg boy uh, may have not had capacity to contract. Um, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because it's a good issue to raise. I would suggest it's a non-starter though if we think about what the impact would be. Um, because we can think about, let's assume that Egg Boy, William Connolly, is that was his name? Uh, that he was, doesn't have capacity because he's under uh, 18. But we've got to ask the question, could a contract be enforced by him? and could a contract be enforced against him? So I want you to think about that as we go through. Think about the reasons why, because you're all familiar with that fact scenario. Okay, you're going to learn an advanced contract. You're going to learn a lot of things. You're going to love it. It's going to be so awesome. And one of the things that you're going to learn is about vitiating factors. So things that impact the consent that a party might make to being a party to a contract and how consent might be vitiated. So this is a set of rules that sit very neatly along the sidelines for, uh, with uh, the idea of intention. But there might be occasions where a contract could be void because of some vitiating factor that impacts consent, particularly if there's illegality or if there's misrepresentation or if there is um, coercion. So a party might accept and intend that their contract is binding, but they might be entering into it not of their own free will. That's not what we're doing here. When it comes to capacity, a person either has capacity to contract or they don't. We're not talking about misleading small children to enter into contracts that they might not want to have been a party to. We're literally discussing whether or not they have capacity. Um, and as a blanket rule, children, and here we, and, and so the technical words that we tend to use are either infants, which is the old fashioned word, but technically an infant in this context is anyone under the age of majority. Again, the technical language. In Australia, that is the age of 18. Um, again, for those of you who do like Professor Google, Take care with American citations because infancy in American states can differ depending on what we're talking about. So you might be an infant from the purpose of whether or not you can buy and drink alcohol up until you're 21. But you might have achieved majority for the purpose of driving an automobile at as young as 15, depending on where you are. So, but in Australia, it's pretty much 18, okay? So that's, that's the rule that we take. So, we're going to focus on minors. Other kinds of people where we might be asking the same question about capacity, though, include, and I hate that these are bundled in together, but we've got mentally ill and intoxicated persons. Okay, they're often combined issues, but they're often not. So, if you have a mental illness that affects your capacity, you might not have capacity. You can still have a mental illness and have capacity, okay? So it becomes an evidentiary question. Um, intoxication is a broad term here. Uh, it can include drugs or alcohol, 
legal or illegal substances. If there is something that impacts your ability to understand and to make, as you know, Jamie Lee Curtis used to say, make good choices. Um, sorry, Freaky Friday, you remember that? Yeah, such a good movie. Um, make good choices. Your ability to make good choices, that might impact the type of contract. So when, again, sorry, the table here on this slide is trying to show that the impact of capacity might be raised in different circumstances and have different impacts. So with minors, we've got to think about what type of contract it is. And that's why we're going to go through it because there's more options. Mentally ill and intoxicated persons, contracts that they enter into where they don't have capacity uh, can be voidable. So that means in, th in this particular case, the person who suffers the incapacity has the ability to avoid the contract. Other than for necessaries, we'll talk about what necessaries are in a minute. So it doesn't mean that if you, if let's assume for the sake of our friendship that I have capacity to contract. And let us in assume that Fabian, were you the one who, you know, he volunteered as not having capacity earlier? Oh, that he, I was looking at a list who had capacity. Oh, you, were, you weren't volunteering that you didn't have it? No. Okay, how about you have capacity and I don't? Sure. Let's work on the basis. We enter into a contract, Fabian and I. Um, I don't have capacity, he does. Can I sue him if he fails to perform under the contract? Let's assume all of the elements of a contract are there. I don't have capacity, he does. Can I sue him? Can he sue me? Probably not. I can avoid the contract. So the contract is voidable by me unless it's for necessaries. So we'll work out what that is. Yes, it does put me in an enormously powerful position. That's why I offered it to you first. Sure. But yeah, you're right, it does. And a lot of these cases, it really depends on what you want to do as to whether you're in a position of power or not. So a number of the cases that we look at are cases where the party who doesn't have capacity is arguing that the contract should be avoided or should be voidable because the other party doesn't have capacity. And what does that mean? So that's... How does that work with um, medical consent? Often how, how does that work with medical consent? Well, often you've got patients who are... Um, been given pain, quite strong pain relievers and they've been asked to sign the consent. So if, so well, and they do sign the consent. I'm going to out and proud myself as somebody who is not a medical lawyer in particular. The question first, is it a contract? Mm. So it's consent to the receipt of a subject substance. Probably there is a contractual element to it. Um, so somebody's in a situation where they've got a contract with a hospital or a doctor, um, whether that's a signed process. But it, it, you notice that they're being asked to give consent. They're not necessarily entering into a contract. There'll be a payment that's involved. There's an insurance and all the rest of it. Um, usually if they are adults, as I understand it, and so you're thinking about a situation where somebody is actually not mentally capable or they're suffering from some intoxication or drugs. So a good example might be um, Ambos turn up to an incident where we've got somebody who's intoxicated with ice. Okay, drug that is well known to make people violent, paranoid, do all sorts of things. Maybe one of the first things that they are going to want to do is to provide some kind of uh, something to calm them down. But usually they're far from consenting to do that. Mm. So how does that work? So not a contract situation necessarily, but becomes a public safety issue. Mm. So again, you've got an elderly person who's being medicated who might have Alzheimer's. They might not have capacity but then usually they will have a guardian who will give that capacity to them. So there's differences in an emergency situation as opposed to a long-term treatment situation. But again, we're skirting around the edges of stuff that's not my, uh, my uh, particular area of expertise. Uh, corporations, on the whole, I don't want you to get caught up in corporations at all here. The thing that you need to understand is that 
Corporations are legal people from the day they are born, from the day they are incorporated. In fact, there are also laws that say they can enter into contracts before they're born if things are done in particular ways. So the, that's a Corporations Act question. We're not going to worry about it. What you need to know is that from the point, as far as c contract law is concerned, a company has capacity to enter into a contract. Questions about corporate capacity are largely around whether or not the person who signed the contract or entered into the agreement had the authority to do so. So, and we don't really need to get too caught up in that because you'll spend some quality time in company law doing that. Bankrupts. Um, if you are a bankrupt, there effectively you still have capacity to contract for our, from our point of view. There are some rules around the size of that contract and the ex what, whether or not the bankrupt themselves is committing an offence if they don't disclose what their limitations are, but they still have capacity to enter into a contract. Uh, and what's the last one? Unincorporated associations, partnerships, um, they don't have capacity to contract. So most, day, most uh, well, actually these days it's changed, but 15 years ago, most law firms were traditional partnerships, groups of usually less than 50 humans doing business in common with a view to making a profit, which is a rough and ready remembrance of what the Partnership Act that says, so you're a partnership because the Act says you're a partnership. If you are doing business in a common with a view to making a profit, then you have to be, you're a partnership. Up until not so long ago, it was quite hard for the professions to incorporate because uh, there was a, a, a belief that um, allowing them to incorporate would help them avoid liability because that's the nature of what a company is. You'll think about this more in company law. But one of the impacts of that is if you're doing business in, in a partnership, then the partnership isn't a legal entity. The partners as a group are, entity, are partners and they do business together and they are jointly and severally liable for each other's debts. So in fact, you need to contract with each of the partners or you contract with a partner who then acts as agent for the other partners. It's not really, they don't have capacity. Unincorporated associations, so the local footy club, a running group that you might be in, the chess club, um, a group of you who get together and take it in turns to buy lottery tickets. Um, you might have an organisation around how you do something together, um, but you're not an incorporated association, you are a group of humans, uh, and so you don't have capacity to contract. There are some others we could talk about. Um, illegal aliens, uh, they tend not to have capacity to contract uh, during wars in particular. Um, again, it's, uh, there, there are sometimes other small groups, most of them prisoners. So um, if you are a, a, a prisoner, uh, in theory, it can, you might not have capacity to contract, but of course you're in prison, so entering into the contract is a little bit more difficult. Sorry, yeah, yes? What if you like, write a book in prison? What if you write a book in prison? It sounds, I've been watching The Good Life, it sounds like, not Good Wife, I should say, it sounds like a plot. Like Chopper Reed or something, he was writing in prison. So there are a whole heap of co uh, different consequences there. So if you are in prison and you give a, uh, an interview or a paid interview or you write a book or a screenplay or, I don't know, paint a painting, like the, um, uh, the Bali Nine guy who painted all of those paintings, can you sell them? Um, Again, there are other rules around whether or not they're proceeds of crime. So if you're writing a book about your criminal escapades, chances are that you have different issues from the contract issues. Um, but again, prisoners, it really has hardly ever come up as an issue. Um, and actually my memory is that the common law is actually restricted to people who are serving a life term. But I would need to check that. You've caught me remembering something badly. Um, not, a, not a huge issue. 
Um, oh, okay. If you're wondering about whether or not a corporation has uh, signed a contract properly, Section 127 of the Corporations Act basically says um, if you have signed the document, so if it's signed by a director or if it's signed in accordance with its constitution, so basically contracts that have been signed or by witnessed by a delegation, sometimes as a lawyer you might, if, particularly if you've got a big company, say you want to enter into a contract with RMIT, like the equivalent of the board is the vice chancellor and the pro vice chancellors and a few other externals. Very rarely are they going to actually sign something. So you would be looking for the delegations to make sure. But again, these are more company law issues. They're more procedural than anything else at this stage. This is where we're going to spend our time talking about minors. So I've talked about this. Uh, infants or minors, people under the age of 18, um, and we're going to talk about the contracts. We're going to talk about the categories of contracts based on the extent to which they're, how they're dealt with. So those contracts that are valid and binding, those that are voidable, and those that are void ab initio. Ab initio is the Latin for from the beginning. So there is and was no contract. So this is my little mud mat for how we navigate this idea. Firstly, ask yourself, are all of the elements of, uh, uh, of formation present? Because if something is missing and there's no contract, it doesn't matter whether you've got capacity or not. If we've got a party who's a minor, then we need to ask what the contract is about. Is it about necessities or necessaries? Necessaries tends to be the more commonly used term, but both are used. Is it a contract for beneficial employment? We'll explore what both of those are. The answer to either of those is yes, then the contract will be binding. Okay, so again, in the example I had earlier, Fabian and I enter into a contract. If it's a contract for necessaries, then it'll be binding on me. If it's a beneficial contract of employment, it will be binding on me. If it's neither of those, ask yourself, is the contract relating to something that is of a permanent or continuous subject matter? So something that is not just a one-off. So does it relate, for example, to land or interests in a business or a share portfolio or rights under a trust? Something that is not just a one-off, I buy it, I eat it, it's gone. The question is, is it still there? Is it continuing over time? Those kind of contracts are binding unless, they can be, uh, unless they're repudiated. So they're voidable. So the minor can get out of them, but can continue on. Any other kind of contract? Again, we're going to drill this down a little bit later, won't be binding unless it's ratified. So in other words, when the minor or the infant achieves their majority, if they ratify the contract at that time. So they, otherwise they actively say, yes, I meant to be bound and I will continue to be bound. Um, and then all of this is subject to statute. So, oh, look at this. I very cleverly coloured it in when I really probably should have done that while I was talking. Sorry about that. OK, so let's classify the contracts by reference to effect. Some contracts are just downright unenforceable. So they're contracts that the parties themselves might decide to be bound, but the courts won't enforce. Good example of this is a contract that meets all of the requirements for a contract, but formalities are required. So, for example, a contract for a transfer of land. There is a formalities requirement. The formalities requirement is it needs to be in writing. Um, so a contract for the transfer of land that's not in writing is an unenforceable contract. Even if it is in writing, but there's a law that says stamp duty needs to be applied. It will be unenforceable 
unless and until that stamp duty is applied. And stamp duty penalties can be enormous if you're going late. Void contract. So these are contracts that have no effect. It's like they never happened in the first place. When you do advanced, you will talk about these a little bit more um, because it will also go to the, the reckoning if the contracts are being pulled apart. Um, because if a court finds that the contracts are, are void, then we're effectively putting the parties back into the position they would have been if they didn't, had never started, as opposed to a damages or other kind of calculation. But we don't have to worry about this now. Voidable. So a voidable contract is a valid and binding contract on the parties. However, one party has an option of rescinding or pulling out as a consequence of some defect. So in the example we've been talking about, lack of capacity gives the infant or the minor the ability to avoid the contract. And then what we're going to talk about now, these are another one for advanced legal contracts, which are contracts that are prohibited by statute or common law. So for example, contracts for human trafficking, contracts relating to the transfer of drugs or so minors contracts, other than those that are binding on them, can generally be enforced by the minor, but not against the minor. Can I just point out this beautiful little apostrophe there? <laughs> just I'm a big fan of apostrophes in the right place, and I just thought I would point it out to you. No reason. Um, okay, so when can a contract be binding on a minor? We keep coming back to this idea of necessaries. So effectively this comes from statute old-fashioned wording because it's been around for a very long time uh, section 7 of the goods act um, it's reproduced in your textbook goods suitable to the condition of life of such minor or other person and to his actual requirements at the time of the sale and delivery so it's interesting this is probably the closest thing we have to a subjective test in the whole of contract law. Goods suitable to the condition of life of such minor. So it opens up the possibility that goods suitable to the condition of Steph might be quite different for the goods suitable to the condition of Kevin. Um, that their needs and their station in life might be different in some way. So we'll talk about that in a second. In your text, there are a number of cases. Um, some of them are hilarious. I think they're a good read. Um, beneficial contracts of employment include things like apprenticeships. So here the trick is understanding that a beneficial contract of employment is a contract of employment that provides benefits in terms of education, learning, something that will improve the station of life of the individual minor. So let's talk about necessaries. Sorry, uh, questions, concerns, frustrations? Necessaries include food, shelter, clothing, goods, services, essential for the reasonable comfort of the minor. So a kid who goes to a private school in Melbourne, who goes in to buy their school uniform, provided they buy the school uniform for the school that they're actually going to, that would be a necessary. A different kid walks in, buys the same school uniform, but goes to a different school, or goes to a school where a uniform is unnecessary, that would not be a necessary, and the contract might be voidable. Uh, against them. Interestingly, they could buy. So again, assuming that there was something more to do, so if they've actually paid the money, they might be in a different situation, but they've gone in, they've got the uniform, they've promised to pay for additional instalments, they don't pay the other three, the question becomes, is it necessary? So in the case of goods, the price that they need to pay is a reasonable price. So again, same example, kid in Melbourne, 15 years old, goes to a private school, 
goes in to buy the uniform, agrees to pay five times the listed price value. I can't even imagine, I've sent a kid to private school, there are no such thing as reasonable prices for private school kid uniforms, but anyway. They pay well and truly above the list price. Even though it's unnecessary, they've paid an unreasonable price. So we can claw back some of the payment. Good, suitable to the condition of life. Case law focuses on two issues. Are the goods and services necessary as a matter of law and as a matter of fact? So they need to be both. So Scarborough and Sturzica is a nice little case. Um, in that case, a miner needed a bike to go to work. They already had a bike. They traded in the old bike, took the new bike, so traded in, they said, okay, we'll pay the, I'll pay the balance of the price later, um, but I'm gonna ride away on my new bike today. Didn't pay, then claimed, well, I'm a miner. It's voidable. I don't need to pay for this. Um, the, uh, the shop then said, well, actually, it's a necessary. You need that bike to get to work. Um, so the court looked at the whole question and said, well, actually, yeah, he no longer has a bike because you've got his old bike. He needs to go to work, so it's a necessary. Hence, he has to pay. The miner wasn't sufficiently, sufficiently supplied. So, ironically, if the miner had owned two bikes, paid a, or paid a deposit instead of trading in his old bike, he would have been in the position where he was sufficiently supplied already, which would mean he wouldn't have to pay the balance. Okay, it can get a bit hard to get your head around it, but it does make sense. I just had a question, Kath. So I just wanted to clarify. So um, just before we were talking about um, contracts can be enforced by the minor, but not against the minor. That's right. So is this is this a case where we're seeing the someone hold a contract over a minor? Yeah. So the contract in this case, it could be enforced against the minor because the subject matter was because, necessary. Okay. So we can compare this with, have we got any Polish people in the room? I'll have a go. Um, Bojak and Grigorowicz. But I apologise to anybody who's listening to my bad pronunciation. Um, young girl in Poland, uh, she wanted to come move to Australia. Her relatives agreed to lend her some money to get on an aeroplane and come to Australia that she could pay that money back when she got settled and started her new life. Um, court found, well, it wasn't a necessary. That this is not a binding contract on her because it's not a necessary. That actually, well, can you imagine what her life might have been like in 1961 Poland? Um, but at the end of the day, she had a job. Everybody in Poland had a job. She had a house. Everybody in Poland had a house. Uh, you know, she had as much food as everybody else around her. Yes, her life here might have been better. Effectively, what the court said is the fact that the contract's beneficial to her doesn't mean it's necessary to her. So the situation is, because it wasn't necessary to her, she couldn't be held to it, and the contract was found to be unenforceable. You don't think this is fair, do you? I could argue that. The, the first kid can walk to work. Like, what's the other? Like, well, clearly they could have walked out. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, look, again, I can't remember the details. <laughs> of the, but ultimately, as a matter of fact, um, so there's a question of law and then a question of fact. So the question of law is, is it necessary? And so one of the, quest one of the ways that the court looks at that is it says, OK, does he need it to get to work? Does he need it to survive? We look at his station in life. Uh, and what his requirements are. So his requirement was to ride to work. Um, so that's been a, so then it becomes a question of fact. So and it could have fallen over on the facts, but clearly it didn't in that case. So you guys got something to add over there? No. I was just saying that when you're a child, generally you just take 
what's given to you, you don't actually question the fact that you might have to pay it back. Most of these cases are now quite old and we're also, it's, I mean, it's quite rare for 13, 14, 15 year olds to be in full time employment, have a job, need to enter into contracts now. But, uh, well, you know, it's actually not even that rare in 1961, really, comparatively. It's really interesting as we look at these cases, we see elements of judgment coming through that sometimes are very hard. So in terms of um, how this is going to come into our lives as lawyers, what's the contemporary relevance of focusing on the minor from your perspective? Oh, from my perspective, yeah, was yeah. it? Um, because it demonstrates the point of law. To be quite frank, the question of capacity in real life has only ever come up for me in really obscure ways. Um, my practice, though, is predominantly commercial and at the top end of town, right? So one of the ways that it has come up is in relation to whether or not an entity that exists under one set of laws in another place could be recognised as be having legal capacity under this set of laws. Yeah. But, but really, I mean, not everything that you're going to learn along the way is going to have immediate re relevance. You'd go, and that's one of the reasons why I'm going to fly through this stuff, because it's not something that you're going to be battling out. But you need these fundamental principles to understand the legal logic that sits behind it. And it's this kind of, what I like to think of as kind of us about logic, really, where we're looking at these contracts where people might fall out, um, and they're using the rules to try and get into something or out of something. So um, the Wayne Rooney case that's coming up is probably a good example of how you can see it playing out commercially, mm -hmm. particularly with child stars and things like that. Yeah. But otherwise, it's yeah, of limited practical benefit. It's I will give you that. No, 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 it's like, yeah. no, it's, but it shows that you're thinking about how you're going to use these mm -hmm. things. And part of this is about the legal logic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, because I have not had time to put my uh, microphone in, I'm throwing my phone at you when you... I was uh, thinking of employment about. contracts of under 18, like you can work from 15. So remember so we can have a statutory overlay. So you've, you can work from 15 because there are laws that say you can employ 15 year olds and there are some rules in the statutes that say how many hours and what kind of supervision and we have oh and S. But we're going to talk about some employment contracts now, but these are for the principles. Mm. Tina. Sorry, I was walking and you've got a tiny voice. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Uh, is that possible to claim the money back from their parents or custodians? Or Can we get to that? But you're right. You, that's a really good question to ask is, is it possible to claim money back from somebody else? But let's get to, the, get to that point when we get there. Um, and again, sometimes parents and guardians can be involved. Um, and we've spoken a little bit about guarantees and indemnities. And again, one of the reasons why we look for guarantees and indemnities. Probably one of the places where this comes up the most is things like telephone contracts. You know, you can't... Uh, most of the companies will say that they won't let you contract um, to have a telephone account of your own until you're 16. Um, but then the question becomes, is a telephone necessary? because that's an ongoing type of contract anyway. One of the areas I find particularly interesting is um, online contracts. So Facebook, in theory, you have to be 13 to join up to Facebook. Now, Facebook is, like, no longer a good example, but I'm not, I've never actually checked what it is for Snapchat or whatever it is that 12 and 13-year-olds year use. There was some music one that was going around. I don't know where people put up. Kids who are purchasing huge amounts on their parents' contracts. Yes, thousands let's think dollars. about that. Like, thousands of dollars, absolutely. Should they have to repay that? So, and this is this is actually an example of where it has come up, well, because, but it's without consent. So it has come up, but they're usually not. They're the parents' contract mm -hmm. and the contract itself. So it becomes an agency issue, but it has come up. The ACCC has had an issue with it. I'm thinking about things where a kid can go online and sign up to a social media account where as a part of the rules of that they might actually give their intellectual property into images that they create or music that they write or fan fiction, you know? Who's to say that the next JK Rowling or who, who was it who wrote the 
There was a fan fiction thing, the erotic one with the greys. It's not Grey's Anatomy, it's something like that, and there was a movie. And anyway, that was fan fiction. Who's not to say that they're not going to be 14 next time around, you know? Like, um, but they've given all of that stuff away. So, again, so, yeah, maybe I'm coming back. Maybe I can think of circumstances. But in my actual practical life, yeah. <laughs> nothing. They've got nothing for you. Um, so, Mercantile's Credit and Spinx, this is a, um, again, you're not allowed to drive or register a car in your own name under the age of 18. There's a statutory way of dealing with that in Australia. This is a UK case. A car might be a necessary if it's used in your employment. Um, Getting legal advice might be necessary. Getting medical attention might be a necessary. And getting educational services <laughs> might be necessary, might be unnecessary. You be the judge. Come on, move, move, move. So how do we know whether something's necessary? Can it properly be regarded as necessary for this kid? Or Necessary, the same rules apply for intoxicated people as well. For this drunk, or this mentally ill person, or this addict, or this person who is under the influence at this moment. Got to think about the nature of the item, their station in life, and whether they're already sufficiently supplied. So Sturzacre is the good example of that. They're already sufficiently supplied with a bike. So oh, oh, they cease to be sufficiently supplied, so they're not. Eliza. This idea of station in life, what, what's the case law that that comes from? Um, it comes directly from the, uh, the... The actual words are used in the provision in the Act still, oh. and so and have been for some time. Mm -hmm. One, um, I, it's mentioned in your textbook. Somebody might remind me of the case name. There's a very nice case about a gentleman, a young gentleman, clearly, because a minor, who goes to get fitted for a lace shirt because he's quite prim and proper. And he goes to get a shirt with a lace bib on it. And he walks... And these are quite expensive shirts for, you know, going to see the Queen or something. I don't know, going and being a Queen for all I know. Oh, God, now I've offended everybody thinking I'm funny. Anyway, um... So he, um, he goes in to buy the shirt and he comes out with nine or ten of them. <laughs> so the case actually explores, well, yes, in his station in life, he needed to have a good white dress shirt handmade by a tailor. And, of course, he should have to pay for that, but he didn't need nine or ten of them. He's been oversold mm -hmm. and he should be able to avoid this contract. And I think that's a good example, too, of how the law works or what the law is designed to do. Because we don't have to ask ourselves whether there was overselling or there was misrepresentation or there was some kind of fraud or force in putting this contract together. It's just, he's a minor. He has to pay for what he needs. And what one kid needs might be different from what another kid needs, depending on where they work, where they live, what their social life is, a range of different things. Um, but they're also their kids. So they can get talked into things that maybe they shouldn't have been talked into. So, coming back to Tina's question, who can recover payment for necessaries that are supplied to a miner? The trader who supplied the miner? Oh, it's not quite your question. Close and any other person who buys necessaries for the miner at the miner's request and on the miner's promise to pay for them. So, if my 14-year-old son convinces me that he needs new school shoes, that they are necessary for his station of life or he's lost the other ones or whatever it happens to be, and I am really pissed off that he's lost those school shoes that I've already paid a substantial amount of money. So I have said to him, well, I will buy them for you now, but you have to pay me back for them. And I'm a lawyer, so I'm saying right now we have, even though it's a family relationship, we have, this is, I'm intending for this to be binding. I will sue you, young man. Um, and so we enter into an agreement. I make the offer to buy the shoes now 
and he and that they are at his request and he makes a promise to pay for them in four instalments over time. Okay, I'm a mean mum. What can I say? It's a good example. Um, and then subsequently, he doesn't pay. Can I sue him? Can I recover? Yes, I can. What if instead of the scenario I described, I lend him the money? Okay, here is $200. Go off and buy some school shoes with that. And he does. Can I recover that $200 or what's a pair of school shoes? I don't know. My kids are older now. I don't remember. They feel like they're prohibitively expensive. $100. I've loaned you $100. Buy a pair of school shoes. Can I recover the loan? The no. Could Did the miner say he could repay? Yeah, he said he'd repay. We have a contract. The money itself is a necessity. The money itself is... Uh, the contract, the loan is not a ne necessary. Well done. The loan is not a necessary. The goods are a necessary. So, again, recovering money from the responsible adult, the easiest thing to do as a trader is to just not worry about whether it's a necessary or not, just say, yep, I'll, I'll sell to your mother or father or guardian or responsible okay. adult. Okay? Then you can work it out from there. But borrowing the money, the kid doesn't have to repay. Me anyway. So what about loans? Common law, lender has no right to recover. In equity, though, a lender might be able to recover the amount that was actually spent on the necessaries. Again, in equity only, and it's a might. So you would need to establish in equity that there was an equity that you have that the miner has benefited from or the miner owes you. So let's go back to our framework. Sorry, we've talked about necessaries. Let's talk about beneficial contracts of service. Oh God, we run out of time so quickly in this class. Contract of employment by which a miner either provides themselves with a the means of self-support or they provide themselves with a the means of obtaining instruction or education to fit them, fit them to earn a living in a suitable trade or a profession. So the traditional beneficial contract of service is an apprenticeship. If you had decided to become a lawyer 150 years ago, you would not have gone to university. You would have been apprenticed or as a law clerk to a practising lawyer, you would have learned at the feet of the wise and moved through the process that way. That is a beneficial contract of employment. You're learning something and you're getting paid at the same time. Instead, it's a beneficial contract of employment. For me, I get to learn things and you know talk to you at the same time. So it is worth remembering that no contract of employment is specifically enforceable. So what's specific enforcement? If I'm going to ask you to remember something, let's make sure we understand what it is. What's specific enforcement? Forcing you to do like a specific act. Yeah, exactly. So it's an equitable remedy. So in equity, equity will look to remedies other than just paying money. So an equity will never provide an equitable remedy where paying money would do. So a really good example of a specific enforcement is um, say say you oh what's a good example um, you've got a non-disclosure agreement you've a confidentiality agreement you have specifically agreed with me as my employee that you will not share information about who my clients are with anybody else. Um, if you were to breach that, and I know you want to breach that contract, you don't want to work for me anymore, and here, contracts of employment aren't specifically enforceable. I can't make you keep working for me if you don't want to. Okay, you can make me pay you if you're working for me in accordance with the contract, but I can't make you stay if you don't want to stay. Um, we might have some other penalty there. But in relation to the confidential information that you've got, I know you're leaving. I am really worried. You're going to go and work for Nia. You're going to give her all that confidential information. Yeah, see, I can tell. <laughs> I can march down to the court 
and I can ask for an order of specific enforcement. Because what you actually paying me damages, if you, that's not what I'm interested in. Damages, paying me money is not ever going to be good compensation for the kind of loss and embarrassment that you know, I might suffer if Nia gets hold of my contact list. But an order of specific performance will stop you from doing the thing. So in relation to employment, it makes sense, doesn't it, that you can't get that kind of order. That people, because that's effectively slavery with payment, isn't it, to re be able to specifically require somebody to do their job if they're ready to terminate the contract, you know, it's so, so it makes sense. So let's talk about this case. Rain, Wayne Rooney, um, we've got football fans here, round ball football fans, you will have heard of this guy. Uh, this is an older case though, he, when he was 15, he signed a two-year management uh, and agency contract with a company called Proform. So he's up and coming uh, football player, they had identified him and they said that they would be his management and agent. So do we know what a uh, sports manager does? You've seen, what's the Tom Cruise movie? Show me the money. Basically what they do is they get advertising deals for the, they negotiate their contracts with teams. They do all of the management stuff for the sports person as a celebrity. Um, before that contract expired, uh, Rooney and his parents terminated the agreement and signed an alternative agency with another firm, so a firm called Proactive. So Proform sued Proactive in tort for inducing a breach of contract. And Proactive's defence was that the contract wasn't legally enforceable against Rooney in the first place. So what do we think? So he signed it, but his parents terminated it. Well, he and his parents together, so his parents were advising him in relation to this, but he has signed the contract. Terms and conditions. So terms and conditions, so that let's assume you haven't got a lot of information here, but the terms and conditions included a fixed term for the contract, and they are seeking to terminate early and that that's a breach of the contract and proactive um, is being sued on the basis that they've induced the Rooney family to breach the contract. Mm -hmm. So let's, we can work on the basis that like for the point of this argument, let's assume that when this, whether or not there's a breach of contract is not in dispute. Let's just assume it might have been a different argument that they took but we'll assume that it's not in dispute. The issue is whether, whether there was a tort of somebody inducing somebody else to breach that contract. So was that breach induced by the alternative agency firm? And the alternative agency says, well, that only happens if there was a contract that could be enforced in the first place. Nia, yeah, you wanted to say something. I was not avoiding you. No, that's okay. So I would say that de determining whether it was a beneficial contract of service, like I'd be looking at, well, was he getting paid and was he learning? Like, what, were they, what was he actually getting out of it? Okay, and so I'm you're absolutely it right. Here that he was learning a trade or anything like that. Like, yeah, he may have been getting some sponsorship money and some products and things like that, but there's not that sort of learning career... You're absolutely on the money. And that's where the court actually came out. He said it's not a contract for necessaries. Now, others might argue, I've had spirited arguments in these classes about if you are an up-and-coming sports person of the calibre of a Rooney, that you couldn't possibly navigate that world alone. So, you know, and he really was a standout star, apparently. And I, like, I can see that. But they, the court said clearly not a necessary. But if we take into account his station in life, um, and possibly even, you know, when he was 15, I think that would have been about 2003, something like that, a little bit before. But in this, 
in the world we live in now, where the social media and smartphones and 24-7 availability, the answer to the necessaries question might be different. I can see how you could run that argument now. It clearly wasn't run as a, at a particularly hard anyway. And the court came out with that word, those words. Clearly not a contract for necessaries. They also found there wasn't a beneficial contract for services. On Yes, he was getting paid. What they did was they would do deals where he would get a percent, they would take a percentage of what he did, but he wasn't learning anything. He wasn't like where, where if he had been induced from one professional team to another professional team where he was being coached and a whole lot of other things were happening, maybe a different answer. But this was a different contract. So they found no contract, no inducement to breach the contract. They're heavily capitalising off slave labour. <laughs> heavily capitalising off slave labour, explain. Because they're getting a percentage of his, his, his efforts. Yes, well, but the thing is, it's not slave labour really, because he can get paid. Yeah. They just can't require him. So he can enforce the contract. It's voidable by him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, Di Francesco and Barnum is another one. Uh, which I think is quite interesting. So in this case, um, it was a young girl. I think at the time that the case was brought, she was about 14 and she was a dancer. So um, I've got to remember which way round she worked. So uh, both De Francesco and Barnum um, own circuses, basically. Barnum is the Barnum of the recent movie with... Um, Hugh Grant in it, The Greatest Showman, um, and TJ Barnum basically ran circuses all over Europe and America and was, you know, sort of really one, uh, apparently, apparently he was an arsehole of the nth degree, but my memory is if I've got them around the right way here, that he might have actually been the good guy in this case. De Francesco also ran a circus. I might have the parties around the wrong way. It really doesn't matter for this purpose. Um, so our dancer basically worked for one of these circuses. But the contract that she had basically said it would give her instruction in relation to dancing. But effectively, she only get, got paid if she was in a show. Um, she barely had anywhere to live. Um, they barely fed her. She had to move around the country all the time. She wasn't getting any other kind of education. The contract was very much weighted in favour of the circus that she was working for. Um, the, she went for a stretch of about two years where she wasn't actually in any show, so she was poverty-stricken, effectively. And the other circus basically offered her a job. Lawyers at 20 paces, even though they didn't want her in a show, they didn't want her in anybody else's shows either. Uh, so again, the question came down to, was there an inducement to breach contract? Could only happen if there was a contract. In this case, Justice Fry said that the provisions of a contract in this case were of such an extraordinary and unusual character which throw or appear to throw an inordinate power in the hands of the master without any correlative obligation on the part of the master. Again, it was almost illusory consideration as part of the issue here, but it really came down to the question, are they learning? Is there a benefit here? Yes, it might be technically an apprenticeship, but the terms of this contract are so pro the master and so anti the apprentice that it's not beneficial to the apprentice in this case. And so it was found that there was no contract. So we've looked at that part. And these, if we've got a necessary or it's a beneficial employment contract, then it will be binding. Um, we are at roughly the halfway mark. Can we take just a really short break? Um, we're going to continue on with this and then we will briefly um, and uh, actually we might not. Uh, we'll have about five minutes of finishing this stuff up and we'll go into um, the next topic.